Hi, I'm Kelly Cervantes, and this is Seizing Life, a bi-weekly podcast produced by Cure Epilepsy. Today on Seizing Life, I'm happy to welcome Channing Seidemann to the podcast. Channing experienced her first seizure at the age of nine and was subsequently diagnosed several months later, beginning a treatment journey that continues to this day. Channing is one of 30% of people living with epilepsy who do not respond to current medications. She is here to share her journey and tell us how she has managed to safely pursue her passion for skiing and horseback riding despite her diagnosis. Channing, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to be able to talk to you um, after having followed all of your advocacy and fundraising efforts online for all these years. I want to start by asking you about your very first seizure. How old were you and what were the circumstances surrounding the event? Well, thank you so much for this opportunity, Kelly. I had my first seizure when I was nine years old on June 27th of 2003. And my brother and my dad and I were playing uh, Conquer the World Risk, which is why we were staying up so late, um, not mission risk. And out of the uh, window on our front porch, we saw strobe lights. And we had to go see what was going on. And we saw a drunk driver getting pulled over. He was getting tested, they were doing all the normal test and he was doing the walk the line test and the next thing that i remember is we i was pulling up to the emergency room and my and i was in my dad's arms and i asked my dad why are we at the emergency room and what did he tell you honestly kelly i don't remember I think that's probably pretty normal (laughs) so you're you're at the the emergency room and I imagine the doctors start doing tests. When and how were you ultimately diagnosed with epilepsy? So five months later, I had then turned 10 at that point. And it was November 28th of that same year, 2003. I had had my second tonic clonic and we found ourselves back at the emergency room. And after having had multiple tonic clonic seizures, we got a diagnosis of epilepsy. So you get this diagnosis of epilepsy after the second tonic-clonic, and they're five months apart. Um, So, you know, that's, you know, you have these five months where I guess you're thinking, you know, it was just a random occurrence, and then it happens again. What did your journey look like from there? Yeah, so after getting the diagnosis, I, I had never heard the word epilepsy before. And they told us it was likely I was going to either grow out of it or it would be controlled with one medication. <clears throat> My apologies, Kelly. My VNS is going off. <laughs> <laughs> no worries whatsoever. So we were, for a few years, we were kind of, we just, we held out that hope that yeah, I would outgrow it and, or I would be able to find that medication that would manage it. Um, I did continue to break through with the tonic clonic seizures. And because we lived in a, a small mountain town, there were no local uh, specialists around. There were no large medical centers. So to find a specialist, we had to drive to Denver. How long of a drive is that? That's It's a four-hour drive. And we tried several specialists. And every specialist we went to, we got the same answer. We got... One third get better, one third get worse, and one third stay the same. And then there was one specialist who even told me to collect stamps when she heard that I horseback I was a horseback rider. Instead, because here you are, clearly I have a passion for skiing and your horseback riding, and those are two very active active sports. So she told you to collect stamps instead. She did. Lovely. So <laughs> In 2007 is kind of when our journey really began. How old were you at that time? I'm sorry. I was now 14, 14 years old. So I, I want to I want to hit pause here because I think that this is all too common. You have your first seizure 
tonic clonic that you're like aware of really um at the age of nine it's now five years later you're 14 and you're saying that this is when your journey really started and and that's it's entirely too common but it's really frustrating to hear that you you you're going four or five years before you feel like your epilepsy journey really started yeah we we were really holding up for that you know, this was not going to be, we were not going to fall into that, that 20%. That's, that's refractory. We're just, you know, we can, it was not, that was, <laughs> that was no. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I know they, it's gotta be the next medicine. And that's, that's the hope, right? That's, that's what keeps us going forward. So what was it that happened um, when you were 14 that you felt like a turning point? So when, when I was 14, we decided, okay, so we're making this journey to Denver. We still haven't found that that specialist that's clicking with our family. So we decided to go to New York to the NYU Langone Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. And there we met Dr. Blanca Vasquez, who works with Orrin Davinsky, and she specializes in epilepsy, women, and hormones. And she was the first epileptologist or neurologist where I actually asked a question. That was the first time I asked a question about what was going on with me. And it was amazing to have, to be able to do that. That was a big step for me in my journey. The turning point was though, that was when we got our first VEG. I'm sorry, that's when you got your first EEG? VEG, video EEG. Oh, okay. Video, you had had EEGs before, but this was the first video EEG. This was the first video EEG. Five years later. It's so frustrating to hear about these lapses in care. I, I'm sorry. Keep going. It's, it's, it's true. It's, but this was the first video EEG. And we spent four days and four nights in the hospital. And I did not get the ton of clock. We didn't see any activity on the video. But the, e the video EEG did capture subclinical data. And it captured enough subclinical data to give us a diagnosis, a lifelong diagnosis of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. And that's something we were not prepared for. We were not prepared for that lifelong diagnosis. Yeah, that's, um, that, is a, that is a tough one. I'm curious how the diagnosis impacted you both um, when you received that initial, epi you know, generalized epilepsy diagnosis um, when you were nine, ten, and then again when you got the juvenile myoclonic diagnosis at the age of fourteen. You know, how did they, these moments impact you both socially as you know a, a growing teenager? Right. So physically, the seizures impacted me. They left me bedridden, the tonic clonic seizures in particular. It would take me days of being in bed to recover, not just from the seizures itself, but the headache, that post-seizure headache, that's just, that can keep you in bed itself. But on a more mental and emotional level, it was this um, absence seizures, the subclinical seizures, the myoclonic jerks, this, those small, just moments in time that have this incredible impact on your quality of life. But they're so, so small. It's just those two seconds of a, a brain fart and it can impact your entire day. It can impact multiple days of your life. When I'm sure it impacted your schoolwork and your friend circle. It, yes. Um, so, and then socially, like you said, I was never really a social butterfly, but you know, I did have those friends in the school and it, it changed the relationship. They became more of babysitters asking me constantly, are you okay? So I, I found that my social community, my social life in the second families that I had throughout the community, barn family, I had my ski family. And that's where I found my social family because I can, I, those were areas where I could relate with the people around me. 
And I think that's really hard with epilepsy in this social aspect. You can't, it's unrelatable unless you have it. It's, and that's very hard. Yeah. It's tough to understand um, unless you're living it. Hi, this is Brandon from Cure Epilepsy. Did you know that 30% of those diagnosed with epilepsy do not respond to current medications? That is why, for over 20 years, Cure Epilepsy has been dedicated to funding patient-focused research to find a cure for epilepsy. Learn more about our mission and our research by visiting cureepilepsy.org. Now back to Seizing Life. You mention these other families uh, largely within the activities. You did not take up stamp collecting. You, <laughs> you continued to ski and to horseback ride. How did you and your family find a way to do that safely? So for the skiing, there were two things you wanted to take into consideration. The first was, you know, are you going 80 miles down the mountain racing? <laughs> Luckily, no, I was not a racer. Um, I enjoyed the bumps. The second thing we wanted to take into consideration was the chairlifts. Having a seizure on the chairlift, you can fall off. Mm -hmm. And luckily, there was a local organization that helps people with disabilities um, on the mountains. And they had come up with a contraption, which was a climbing harness that you could clip to the chairlift. And this was a great start for us. But the problem with that one was that it left us, it left you dangling from the chairlift. And that just didn't seem smart to us. So what we did is we took the, the climbing harness and we added a daisy chain to it. So we have the carabiner and, and then the front of the climbing harness and we put the daisy chain on. And then we throw, I throw the daisy chain over the back seat of the chairlift and bring it through where the uh, seat and the back breast kind of meet. And you kind of thread it through there and you connect it to the carabiner. So it keeps you in that upright position. And the daisy chain is also crucial because when you switch chairs, you, need, you may need to tighten it and you may need to loosen it. And so that's how we solve that. For horseback riding, I wear a helmet, the highest rated safety helmet, and I also wear an inflatable vest. So if I were to come off my horse, it would inflate in 0 0.09 seconds before I hit the ground, protecting my neck and my internal organs, my back. So I'm, and I also wear a quick release stirrup so I don't get uh, dragged. So we found solutions. So it didn't impact my quality of life as much. That's incredible. I love that you are still able to enjoy these activities that you love, because I think that that, you know, you talk about the mental health impact, but being able to not lose these activities probably greatly, greatly helped your mental health and your positivity toward life. It, it, it saved that part of it. Yes. That quality of life is, is huge. Now, have you ever had a seizure while skiing or horseback riding? Uh, both. <laughs> oh my uh, God. Um, so the horseback riding experience, I was at a competition in Colorado. It was a jumping competition. And we were going over a jump. I was, was in the middle, middle eight, mid air, and I lost my vision. We had, a, a, this was a smaller seizure, but it impacted my sight. My horse knew, she knew what was going on. She knew that I wasn't with her, but muscle memory kicked in and I was able to stay on. And once we came back to the ground, she, she walked, she brought me to the rail. I still couldn't see, but I knew where I knew she had brought me to the rail. I could hear the, the crowd and the judges as we walked by them. I just still couldn't see, but I could know where I was. And she took me to the end gate where my parents and my trainer were. Wow. 
but she's that's not the only time I've had a seizure on a horse. And they've known every time, they've stopped every time, and they've taken care of me every time. Wow. And on the ski slope? On the ski slope, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to hang out with ski patrol and go into the backcountry and do ski on the go beneath those closed ropes where you're not allowed to go. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, on our way up to one of those runs, though, I did end up having a seizure and I got the bumpy toboggan ride down instead. <laughs> but I was in safe hands and nothing bad happened and I was still had a great morning on the slopes. You I'll take are that. so brave. I am beyond impressed with you. So now tell me about your treatment journey. Um, you know, what, what medications have you tried? You know, I, we know, you know, you have a VNS. What has sort of your, your treatment journey been like up to this point? My first drug I was on was Lamictal. But then I um, also had tried Zonagran, Topamax, Vimpat. And um, we tried all of those before the video EEG and combinations of both of all of them. But once we got the diagnosis of juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, we started Keppra because it, it targeted that epilepsy. And I unfortunately continued to break through. Have you ever experienced a duration of seizure freedom? Between 2013 and 2019, I went six years tonic-clonic free. Wow. And what do you attribute to that time period? I, I was on a significant amount of medication to control those. Scores. And did you have side effects from the, that substantial amount of medication? Yeah. So you have to, once you, you get the meds to be able to manage the seizures, but that comes once you are on that many meds and that dosage of medication then the side effects can become, can impact your quality of life more than the seizures. Yeah, it's a balance. What were, what were some of the side effects that you experienced? So they all, uh, all the side effects, all, medic all the medications had side effects such as um, dizziness, fatigue, nausea, just general noise. But there were a couple that had more severe side effects. Depakote, it's been known to mess with my your reproductive system. Felbitol has a history of causing aplastic anemia. We never thought we'd be on either of those drugs. My cocktail now includes two, both of them. They're they're pretty heavy duty drugs. I'm familiar with both of them. What ultimately led you to try the VNS and what has your experience been with the vagus n nerve stimulator? It was the side effects that ultimately led the VNS because of the impact it had on my quality, the side effects we're having on my quality of life. That's when we took a really good look at the VNS with the hopes that ha by having the VNS, we could then maybe decrease a medication and try and get rid of some of those side effects. And the VNS is interesting because we don't know what it's doing when it's not doing, but we've, we've heard many stories where people have turned their VNS off because they don't feel like it's doing anything. And their seizures have come back with a vengeance. So while I don't know what it is and is not doing, I do think it's doing something. And what are the side effects like with the VNS? Because as, <clears throat> excuse me, as we know, all of these treatments have side effects. Yeah. So the main one with the VNS is I can lose my breath or get short of breath. One of the settings on the VNS is an auto sim that detects your heart rate. There's obviously a correlation between that increased heart rate and, and those tonic clonic seizures. And so should it, you know, detect that an increased heart rate of a certain amount within a certain amount of time, 
it will send off an extra burst of, of stimulation on its own. And when I ride, especially when I get my, when I get my breath up and I'm um, exercising, it can set off that VNS and I can definitely get short of breath. But there's also the side effect of the Godfather voice, or as my brother would call it, C3PO. It sort of digitizes the vocal cords a little bit. It yeah. does, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what are your seizures like today? So today I struggle with the myoclonic jerks on a daily basis. And I also struggle with occasional drop seizures and occasional absence seizures, as well as a subclinical. There are also the, those breakthrough tonic clinics that I have. And how often are you having those? The, I'd say the drop seizures are more frequent these days, but the tonic clinic seizures, I'm going to say probably once or twice a year these days. I mean, that's a lot better, but I will say that any amount of seizures is too many seizures, period. Yeah. Um, it's just those tonic clonic ones tend to be the scariest. The drop seizures are no walk in the park either. And the other ones still affect your life. I mean, at the end of the day, it is finding that balance with the quality of life and the side effects and and the seizure. I mean, it's you're walking a tightrope every single day. Yeah. And interestingly enough, it's for us, it's not the the top clonic seizures are are the yes, that the they look like the, the big and scary ones, but there's also those small seizures that for me, those are, are more scary than the tonic clonic ones because like walking across the street, I could space out for two seconds. Or even in the shower, these days I'm dealing with um, heat as a trigger. And just taking a shower caused because I was in there for maybe too long, maybe the water was just a tad bit too hot. I had a drop seizure in the shower. So it's, which is why sometimes I do feel safe on a horse than I do crossing the street. Because on a horse, I am have a blow up vest and a helmet and a, on the street, I'm very vulnerable to cars coming in each direction. I think that that is, it's such an important message. And I, I thank you for sharing that. All of the seizures suck in the, sometimes the ones that look smaller are even more dangerous than the ones that look scarier. Now, Channing, I know that you have taken your love of horseback riding and are utilizing that to raise money for epilepsy research. The event that you uh, put together is called Dressage for a Cause. And um, for the record, I just had to be corrected on how to pronounce that. I know nothing about horseback riding, but I have this awesome ribbon that you guys sent me and I love it. It's on my desk. Um, tell us about this event. So Dressage for a Cause is the platform I use in my effort to fund a $100,000 research grant for a cure, the Taking Flight Award. We're $19,000 into that goal. The event itself, it's, it's centered around a, in a horse show that takes place every November at the farm that I ride at. And it is just that, Kelly. It is my dressage riding for a cause to find a cure for epilepsy. You're incredible and, and taking, taking this fight so public and being the advocate that you are, it's, um, it's not always easy. And I, I commend you for that. Thank you. It's it's thanks to the epilepsy warriors who give me that motivation, and and we honor those those warriors by having their names embroidered in some of the saddle pad that I ride in. And unfortunately, in 2020, it was a two day event, and my brain didn't let me show up for one of those for the first day, and I was devastated because I didn't get to fight for my warriors. But the next day, I had the post seizure headache day, and usually that prevents me from putting my helmet on because. It's just that bad of a headache. But there's those warriors on my saddle pad. And so we put that riding helmet on and, and we got in there for the warriors. And that, that's why I ride for, for a cure. For the record, you're making me cry. Um, 
you are a warrior in and of yourself. And uh, hearing you speak this way when you are battling yourself every single day is is really remarkable. To that end, I'd love to know, you know, you are now in your 20s. You have been battling epilepsy now for, you know, over half your life. What advice would you give to another young person who has recently been diagnosed or the teen who, you know, has this diagnosis and is trying to navigate adolescence? You know, what what do you want them to know? What have you learned? There's two things that come to mind. And the first one is finding the right doctor because you got to have that relationship. And it's so hard to find that doctor that fits you because it's so hard to accept it when you're first diagnosed. And so it's that E word that you don't talk about. So you got to find that right doctor where you can ask what is going on with me. (laughs) The second thing that I would recommend that I have my, that would be my advice, is be solution oriented. So that quality of life that you have isn't impacted more or is impacted as little as possible. There's always a solution out there. You may not, you know, you may not be able to race down a mountain, but you can still ski on a mountain. There's always a, even if it's a compromise between the two, find the solution so you can have that so you can have something that you can go to when epilepsy gets you in that place when it just brings you down and you can't get out of that funk so you can have that place to go to well for the record i think that you are remarkable and um it has been an honor to speak with you today and Thank you for sharing your story, and um, I can't wait to uh, live stream one of your upcoming shows. That'll be great fun. (laughs) Thank you, thank you, thank you, Channing. Thank you for having me, Kelly. Thank you, Channing, for sharing your epilepsy journey with us. Your determination to find a way to safely continue horseback riding and skiing is inspiring, and we thank you and your family for supporting research through Dressage for a Cause. As we noted at the top of the podcast, one-third of those living with epilepsy cannot attain seizure freedom through medication. That is why Cure Epilepsy has funded epilepsy research since 1998. We remain unrelenting in our commitment to help find treatments and cures that will bring seizure freedom to those living with refractory epilepsy like Channing. We hope you will support epilepsy research by visiting cureepilepsy.org forward slash donate. Through research, there is hope. Thank you. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Cure Epilepsy. The information contained herein is provided for general information only and does not offer medical advice or recommendations. Individuals should not rely on this information as a substitute for consultations with qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with individual medical conditions and needs. Cure Epilepsy strongly recommends that care and treatment decisions related to epilepsy and any other medical conditions be made in consultation with a patient's physician or other qualified healthcare professionals who are familiar with the individual specific health situation.